Palestinians are racist to black people. And if you look around, it's black people that are out there advocating for the rights of Palestinians. This should be a lesson for Palestinians and the Arab community in general to stop being racist towards black people. Palestinians are Arabs. Satan, have you ever heard about the Arab slave trade? <laughs> Go and look it up. Go and read up on the Arab slave trade and see how oh, brutal they were to black people. See me? We're not going further. All I say is, we're not taking no side with none of them post soldiers. Make them kill off them bomber clad self. So there is a neighborhood in Gaza, um, on the Gaza Strip, where 11,000 um, Afro Palestinians live. It is called Al Abib. You know what that neighbor what that means? Slave. Yes. That is where black people live. And that is what the Arabics call that neighborhood. Slaves. The land of the slaves. To understand what it's like to be black in Palestine, one must grasp first the historical backdrop that shapes this narrative. Being black in Palestine is a journey through intersecting histories, cultures, and struggles. It is a narrative that resonates with the echoes of the global black diaspora as individuals find themselves navigating a space where their identity intersects with the challenges of occupation, displacement, and the quest for self-determination in the heart of the Middle East. Historically, Palestine has been a melting pot of cultures, religions, and ethnicities. Against this backdrop, the black experience therein is both unique and shared. The etchus of African heritage in the region, intertwined with the struggles of the Palestinian people, create a dynamic and multifaceted identity. From the Nubian presence in ancient times to the contemporary African diaspora in places like Jericho, the black experience is embedded in the historical fabric of the land. Yet, the complexity of being black in Palestine extends beyond historical roots. Rather, it intertwines with the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where racial dynamics become entangled with political realities. Black Palestinians, much like their counterparts in other parts of the world, face the challenges of systemic discrimination, unequal access to resources, and a struggle for recognition. This, sadly, is what it is. Welcome to yet another poignant video segment. Today, we are taking a dive at what it's like to be black in Palestine. We are also visiting briefly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in relation to the discrimination suffered by peoples of color in Palestine and all over the globe at large. Before we continue, don't forget to support our persistent efforts to fill you in by pressing the like button before you, share with your family and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and kindly subscribe to keep the channel growing. Your support is immensely valued. Now back to the basics. Beginning from recent times. Recent times. There is pandemonium. The bloodiness oozing across the entire globe as another Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been hatched for quite some time recently since the month of October and is now at its outrageous peak. This time, more than 10,000 people have been killed in just 31 days of relentless Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip, according to Palestinian health officials, with no signs of a ceasefire in the besieged enclave. Thousands of Palestinians have left northern Gaza on foot, waving white flags and moving southwards in search of refuge that has become increasingly elusive as Israel pounds the entire enclave with airstrikes. Everywhere is in the strangest, bloodiest disarray. And yet, as heartbreaking, as the news is right now. And it is heartbreaking. As we speak, the world feels more unstable and more dangerous than it has in a very long time. And of course, over the last few weeks, we have watched a deadly struggle unfold in the Middle East. Triggered by the horrific murder of more than 1,400 mostly civilian Israelis, many of them children at the hands of Hamas, 
as well as the abduction of over 200 hostages. And then an Israeli response that has so far resulted in the displacement of well over a million people. The death of at least 9,000 Palestinian civilians, thousands of them also children. The cutoff of water, food, electricity to a captive population that risks creating an even, even greater humanitarian crisis. It is hard to feel hopeful. The images of families mourning, of bodies being pulled from rubble, force a moral reckoning on all of us. The United Nations said on Wednesday that 15,000 Palestinians had fled northern Gaza the day before, using the main traffic artery, Salah al-Din Road. This was three times the figure estimated on Monday. The Israeli military had given residents of northern Gaza a four-hour window to leave on Wednesday. Thousands of people are seen moving south, not car convoys. They're walking and waving white flags in fear of being attacked. They're moving together in large groups, believing there could still be some safety in numbers in a desperate journey south to a future they have no idea what it holds. Palestinians say that no corner of the Strip is safe from Israeli bombardment. More than 70% of Gaza's 2.3 million residents have been utterly displaced. The majority, including children, the elderly and people with disabilities, have fled with minimal belongings. Some reported having to cross Israeli checkpoints to reach the southern areas and witnessing arrests by Israeli forces. In a statement on Monday, Gaza's Ministry of Health said the death toll has risen to at least over 10,400 Palestinians in counting, including over 4,300 children with many victims still trapped beneath the rubble and an Israeli siege drying up access to vital goods like fuel, food, and electricity. And what could have possibly brought about this insane devastation in the cities of Palestine? The war, it was said, broke out on the 7th October when Hamas launched attacks on southern Israel that authorities there said killed more than 1,400 people. Hamas militants had stormed into Israel on a Saturday morning 7th October 2023, slaying hundreds of residents in homes and streets near the Gaza border and bringing gun battles to Israeli towns for the first time in decades. Hamas and other militant groups in Gaza made away with about 150 soldiers and civilians whom they're currently holding hostage, according to Israel. Israel had stepped up its offensive on a Tuesday, October 10th, 2023, expanding the mobilization of reservists to 360,000. Israel's military said it had regained effective control over areas Hamas attacked in its south and of the Gaza border. The displacement in Gaza, where the majority of the population are refugees with parents or grandparents who were forcibly expelled from their homes and barred from returning during the founding of Israel in 1948, have reignited a painful sense of deja vu. We cannot find food, and there is no flour. People are waiting in long queues for water. Um, Moamin al-Arja a mother sheltering in southern Gaza, told Al Jazeera. In a split second, Gaza has been turned into a black box. The only light in the Gaza Strip at night will be from fires started by Israeli bombs and a handful of hospitals powered by sputtering generators. The territory's last functioning power plant ran out of fuel on Wednesday, two days after the Israeli defense minister announced that there would be a complete blockade during the siege. No water, no food, no electricity, and almost no information either. Israel's war on Hamas for killing more than 1,200 people this weekend has effectively turned the home of 2.3 million people into a deadly prison. Dwindling electricity and the destruction of civilian infrastructure have left very few ways for Palestinians in Gaza to communicate with one another or the world outside. Notwithstanding, it would seem that the play out of this horrible event is beginning to wake the world a bit on some major unfinished business, thus have been the major contributory factor to the recent momentum for global dialogue on repertory justice for the people of African descent held by the Social, Humanitarian and Cultural Committee Sochum, also known as the Third Committee of the General Assembly of the United Nations on the 30th of October 2023 as numerous delegates in the meeting also voiced support for the right of Palestinians to self-determination. 
Barbara G. Reynolds, chair of the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, highlighted an analysis of how post-colonial structures, systems, and practices continue to mimic the intent laid down during enslavement and colonization across the intersections of civil, political, economic, and cultural spheres, subjecting people of African descent to a third wave of economic deprivation and hardship. These structures, which are in banking, finance, insurance, taxation, land rights, and land use, continue to constrain wealth creation and, most importantly, intergenerational wealth creation. Reynolds recognized that black debt, or systems and policies that have effectively promoted precarity and drained assets from individuals and communities of African descent via financial instruments, is a burden at national, community, and individual levels. Accordingly, she urged all member states to put in place mechanisms to eliminate structural and systemic bias and discrimination against people of African descent. Adding to that, Epsi Campbell Barr, chair of the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent, highlighted the continued excessive use of force by law enforcement against people of African descent, persistent violence against migrants and asylum seekers of African descent, and backsliding in the area of equal education. Against this backdrop, she underlined the importance of drafting a United Nations Declaration on the promotion, protection, and full respect for the human rights of people of African descent. Representatives from all over the globe were present in this meeting, owing to the height of the emergence of the situation on ground. The committee's interactive dialogue centered on the theme, Racism and Self-Determination, wherein the elimination of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance were critically discussed. Numerous delegates expressed solidarity with Palestinians, noting that all peoples, including those under foreign occupation, have the right to self-determination. Among them was the representative of Bangladesh, who condemned in the strongest possible terms the occupation by Israel as well as its genocidal policies and actions in Palestine. Israel's current military operation in Gaza has crossed all boundaries of international norms and principles, he said, adding that over 7,000 civilians in counting have been killed so far, half of them children, as at the time of this meeting. Voicing regret over the inability of the Security Council to stop Israel's atrocities, he called for an immediate humanitarian truce and welcomed the announcement of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to prioritize investigation in the situation of Palestine. Adding to that, Jordan's delegate said that over the past three weeks, 59 staff of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East UNRWA, have been killed in Gaza. Further, indiscriminate shelling and the collective deprivation of food, water, and fuel heighten exposure of the most vulnerable in Gaza to racial discrimination and xenophobic violence, she warned, expressing dismay over the situation in Gaza and the speedily climbing mortality was also the representative of Indonesia, who said they represent dreams shattered, families broken, and futures stolen. The peace process must be restarted to avoid a situation where there is nothing left to negotiate with or, tragically, no one left to negotiate with, she said. For Palestinians under Israeli occupation, the right to self-determination only exists in theory said the representative of the League of Arab States, citing Israel's attempts to expel the people of occupied Gaza to the south before their displacement to neighboring countries as flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. The League will leave no stone unturned to obtain Palestinians' legitimate rights through peaceful diplomatic and legal means, so that they can live in peace, freedom, and dignity in their independent Palestinian state. Meanwhile, Israel's delegate said that since the 7th of October, terrorist attacks, anti-Semitism, and attempts to delegitimize Israel have reached a fever point. Jews are being attacked worldwide, as demonstrated by protests that erupted worldwide following the attacks. The events of October 7th and the days that followed have shown the importance of the Jewish right to self-determination, she asserted. In this meeting, many drew attention to profound disparities that people of African descent worldwide continue to face with Cameroon's delegate underscoring that illegal and financial consequences of the transatlantic slave trade need to be fully acknowledged. 
However, there is systematic opposition to a resolution for specific global action to eliminate racism and racial discrimination, she observed, underlining the need to restore the truth and the role played by the slave trade in colonization, as well as unconditional return of cultural property from museums. While this development would sound promising, nonetheless, happening in twin line alongside the dangerous upheaval and mayhem unfolding vastly in the cities of Palestine, we would like to know what is going on at the same moment with the black communities living in Palestine and in diaspora around the globe, how they feel about the unfolding disaster in a place where being black, where being what they are, feels like a curse. It is not fair that a Palestinian child cannot grow up in a state of their own, living their entire lives with the presence of a foreign army that controls the movements, not just of those young people, but their parents, their grandparents, every single day. It's not just when settler violence against Palestinians goes unpunished. It's not right to prevent Palestinians from farming their lands or restricting a student's ability to move around the West Bank or displace Palestinian families from their homes. Neither occupation nor expulsion is the answer. That was quite a poignant speech from one of the great personalities of the global black community, former U.S. President Barack Obama, which has been making the rounds on the internet for weeks now in respect of the Israeli-Palestinian war. But that's not all yet. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free. We must make sure that those who support Palestine, especially our brothers and sisters who believe that Palestine is under attack. This nonsense of Israel can only be stopped if South Africa takes a position and say leave, the whole African continent will join, the whole progressive international world will join and say Palestine embassies must leave. We are here to do a simple task, to tell Israel and the world to know that we are on the side of Palestine. We are not neutral because neutrality during the difficult times is equal to sailing out. Another most moving humanitarian speech of the time by Julius Malema out there a South African and bold representative of the global black community in respect of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. There's more from Malema. Netanyahu is a number one terrorist and he must be declared everywhere he goes. He must never know peace because he's a number one world terrorist and the world must fight against terrorists. And while the black solidarity goes on, it would feel quite relieving, on the other hand, hearing this from a Palestine woman which has gone viral on the internet. Palestinians are racist to black people. And if you look around, it's black people that are out there advocating for the rights of Palestinians. This should be a lesson for Palestinians and the Arab community in general to stop being racist towards black people. Because when she hits the fan, it's black people that come out and they fight for the oppressed. Allah says he will not change a people until they change themselves. So if you're there making da saying, oh Allah, why are the Israeli soldiers um, racist to the Arabs and they're doing all of these things to the Palestinian people and you can't understand why this is happening, then look within yourself. You as an Arab, you as a Palestinian, you in your own family, how many of you are racist to people that are black Palestinians? Even broader Muslim communities, from Pakistani communities to Bangladeshi communities, Moroccan, Libyan communities, the Gulf communities. How many people say we are Muslim and in the same breath they mistreat other Muslims because of their skin color or their country of origin? The streets of the global black community have indeed been seriously boiling with mixed feelings these recent days, while a handful are against the inhumanity pervasive of the devastation caused in Gaza by the bombings of Israeli's military unit, there are many others in the black communities who are indignant and feel somewhat indifferent towards the sad outcome. Rather, they are reminded of the unending discrimination, suffering and untellable denial, which they are being made to endure for so many years now in the hands of both these nations at war, like that Palestinian woman just pointed out.
There is also the very sad heart-wrenching affair in the Democratic Republic of the Congo (DRC) that the black communities are concerned and embittered no one is talking about. The Eastern DRC has been plagued by violence for decades, and the situation has worsened in recent months. Armed groups, including the M23 rebel group, have been fighting for control of territory and natural resources. Civilians have been caught in the crossfire, with hundreds killed and displaced in recent months. The ongoing violence in the Eastern DRC has led to a severe humanitarian crisis. Millions of people are displaced and in need of food, water, and shelter. The UN World Food Program WFP, has warned that it is facing a funding shortfall that could force it to cut food aid to millions of people in the Congo. The global black community thinks that the general state of affairs in the DR Congo is way too devastating, too despairing to not be talked about, too horrible and too dismal and cheerless to not have raised by now the expected concern it should from the international community. Most people of color would prefer to sob on behalf of their brothers in the Congo Republic than to sob on behalf of a people who do not and have never cared the slightest about them. Let's have a look. First of all, all y'all who got a problem with me because I said I'm focused on black people's problems, well, guess what? You can stay mad. I'm focused on black people's problems. Ain't nobody helping us. You got 27 million Africans in the Congo displaced environmental issues, hunger, poor health care. You got a million Ethiopians who've been murdered. You got Sudanese who have died. Ain't nobody said nothing about the Sudanese. Ain't nobody said nothing about the Ethiopians. Ain't nobody said nothing about the Congolese. But you want me to cry tears for the Arabs? Listen, I hope the Arabs in the West Bank in Gaza, I hope they get all they get. I hope they are protected. I hope nobody dies. I hope those babies' lives are safe. I hope the women are cared for. I hope that there's no bloodshed, no violence. But if you think I'm going to take time out of struggling for African people, if you think I'm going to stop my agenda to liberate my people to go cry for people who don't cry for me, if you think I'm going to stop what I'm doing and pay attention to what's going on over there when y'all don't even pay attention to what's going on in Africa, y'all don't pay attention to what's going on in Ethiopia. Y'all don't pay attention to what's going on in the Congo. The greatest humanitarian crisis in the world is in the Congo, not the West Bank. I said the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world is in the Congo, not the West Bank, not the Gaza Strip, not Israel, but in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So don't tell me I got to cry for whites and browns. I'm crying for black people and I don't care who don't like it. I don't care who don't like it. You got police and black people in America every day. We got police and black people in America every day. We got a hunger. We got gentrification. We got miseducation. We got mass incarceration. And you want me to go crying for white and brown people? I'm not going to do it. My priority is on Africa and African people. Now that was only a few out of very many agitating voices already. And while the commotion goes on, a black woman who had expected at least some remorse from an Arab in a conversation which had broken out between them shares her story. Melanated dominant people, come here. I'm madder than a hoe in church. You ready? I go to the gas station. It's ran by Arabs, Muslims. Normally, they're very friendly, flirtatious, even. So, the store owner single me out have no idea why he picked me but this conversation didn't go like he thought it was gonna go he says it's a damn shame what the um jews are doing to the palestinians and and muslims are being persecuted and they're doing a genocide in the palestinian and, and they don't belong there right i listened and i said well it was the Muslims that enslaved Africa for over 1,300 years. They castrated black men in the Sahara Desert with dull knives and many of them died. And they trade thousands upon thousands of black women across the desert. Black women bones lined the Sahara Desert so that it was said you didn't need a map to get to Europe. And still now in Libya, 
according to CNN docu documentary in 2017. The Muslims were selling black Cameroonians and Nigerians on a slave market in 2017. He became furious. And he said, oh, you must be a Christian. You, that's why you on Israel's side, you must be a Christian. I said, why would I be a Christian? The Jews Torah told them that black people were under the curse of Ham and therefore we were sanctioned by Yahweh to be slaves. And some of the brutal things that they did to melanated dominant people in slavery was used through the Old Testament. Murder, slaughter, rape, mutilation of black people. Jews said that black people were more like apes than they were like humans. So no, I'm not on their side either. Can I tell you that he put me out that store? I know you fucking lied. Put me out the store. Would not sell me my little chips or my little soda. <laughs> I have never been so proud of being put out of somewhere. Why am I telling you this story? Melanated dominant people, stay out of their business. Stay out of it. Being black in Palestine. The intersectionality of being black and Palestinian is particularly evident in the struggles for land, justice, and equal representation. It is a delicate dance between asserting one's individual identity and participating in the collective fight for the right to exist freely in one's homeland. This duality creates a profound tension that requires navigating the terrain of racial and national identity simultaneously. The challenges faced by black individuals in Palestine are manifold. From systemic discrimination to microaggressions, the struggle for recognition and equality echoes across their daily lives. Nisreen Salem is an Afro-Palestinian from Egypt who has been mocked due to her skin color and hair for most of her young life. The 25-year-old is one of at least 400 Afro-Palestinians from Nigeria, Egypt, Chad, Senegal, and Sudan who live within the walls of occupied Jerusalem's old city, adjacent to Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. The hardest part was when I started hating everything about myself because I was being pointed at and attacked verbally by both Palestinians and Jews everywhere I went she said sadly. We face double the harassment and double the racism for being Palestinian and for being black. And how about that jocular expression used in Gaza, for instance, when a man, woman, or child of African descent passes by, hey, cappuccino, hey, brown one, and hey, black one. Sometimes the racism is expressed non-verbally through looks. Gazans, however, seem unaware of this racism. I'll monitor. One of the leading Middle East online media met with political activist Sama al Rawag, age 33, at her home and asked her whether she experienced any discrimination due to her skin color. She made light of the matter. Yet, when her father Ahmad al Rawag, 80 years of age, recounted incidents he had experienced involving racism, Sama was shocked. That's the first time I've heard such stories from you, she said sadly to her father. I struggled a lot to overcome the difficulties caused by the color of my skin. I always had to doubly prove myself at school, at work, and in life. Because I'm dark-skinned, Ahmad, Sama's father said. He had added that they are originally from Sudan. His ancestors came at the beginning of the 20th century and lived in Palestine, in a village called Ruben, neighboring Jaffa, until the year 1948 when they were forced to migrate to the Gaza Strip. But I never felt that I did not belong here. Palestine is the homeland I have always known and is a homeland to about 10,000 other dark-skinned people in the Gaza Strip, Ahmad had said, remembering sadly when he was a teacher in the late 1950s and one of his colleagues had invited everyone except him to a wedding. That day, I felt embarrassed and I decided that no one in my family would go through such an experience, he said. Ahmad, who managed to complete his education, also participated in handball competitions abroad in the 1960s. I didn't want the color of my skin to be an obstacle for me or my children. I had to put them through private schools so that they didn't hear anything that would offend them, Ahmad exposed. Sama agreed with her father and added, 
I never felt that the color of my skin made me different from others. I always had the best toys and clothing. I studied in a private school, and I felt that people liked me. Sometimes I heard comments that bothered me, but this is the first time I've heard about my father's suffering. Sama did not deny that she has been hearing more discriminatory words recently, but she denied that it is about hate. I hear phrases such as, hey galaxy, hey brownie, but I sometimes feel that it's mere banter and not for the purpose of harassing me, she said. There are no clear historical sources that speak about the African minority in Gaza, but there is an oral history passed down by families from one generation to the next. Journalist Ali Bakit, age 28, for instance, said that he learned from his great uncle that his family originally comes from Ghana. Africans first entered Palestine during the Islamic conquests, specifically when Caliph Omar ibn al-Khattab entered Jerusalem, accompanied by a number of Africans. African communities from Chad, Nigeria, Sudan, and Senegal came in the late 19th century, either for worship or to participate in the resistance. Bakit noted in an interview with Al Monitor, according to Gaza Through History, a book by Ibrahim Sakik, wealthy families in the Gaza Strip participated in the slave trade hundreds of years ago. Another book, Delighting in the Wealth of Gaza's History, notes that some of the residents of the Palestinian village of Berbera were dark-skinned people who came from Morocco. Al Monitor asked multiple historians about the African minority, yet most of them noted that there were no books dealing with their history. The majority of families with dark skin in Gaza originate from Sudan and Egypt. Many of them were captives brought to work in the Ottoman Empire's army hundreds of years ago, noted Palestinian historian Salim Mubayed speaking to Al Monitor by phone. By the 9th century, it is estimated that some 3 million Africans had been resettled as enslaved people in the Middle East, working as soldiers and laborers in the riverine plantation economies. As is illustrated by the life of Mansa Musa, king of the medieval kingdom of Mali, pilgrimage by African converts to Islam became an established practice. Though regular pilgrimage only became commonplace in the 15th century, as the Islamic faith spread beyond the narrow confines of sultanate courts to the people at large. There are some Palestinian communities that trace their origins to pilgrims from Sudan and Central Africa, mainly Chad, who are said to have reached Palestine as early as the 12th century. The African Palestinians who now live in the two compounds near Al-Aqsa Mosque have called the area home since 1930. They have experienced prejudice, with some Palestinian Arabs referring to them as Abid, meaning slaves, and to their neighborhood as the Habs al-Abaid, slaves' prison, and their color has led to objections against them marrying Palestinians with lighter skin. According to Mausa Kous, director of the African Community Society and a former member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, PFLP, Sometimes, when a black Palestinian wants to marry a white Palestinian woman, some members of her family might object. Interracial marriage with Afro-Palestinians has become more common only in recent years. In colloquial Palestinian Arabic, standard usage prefers the word sumer, meaning dark color, over sod, which has an uncouth connotation. Notwithstanding, Several countless playouts of discriminatory racist practices on Afro-Palestinians could get any sane mind seriously reflecting. Next to the Rawag family's home, there is an entire area on Jala Street inhabited by dark-skinned Gazans. The Palestinian people and taxi drivers would often refer to the area as the Black Neighborhood or Slaves Neighborhood. Mohammed Abu Rashid, age 13, who is a talented soccer player and dreams of becoming like Lionel Messi, recounted his experience to Al Monitor. At school, they say, hey, chocolate, but I don't pay attention to them. His friend ahead, age 17, furiously barked out, interrupting, liar, we do get bothered. Ahead didn't stop there, pointing to a white boy with colored eyes riding a bicycle around them. That boy, for example, always says to us, hey, brownie, hey, chocolate. The white boy smiled and responded, because I like you. Abed Al Rawag, age 21, who works at a grocery store at the neighborhood's entrance, told Al Monitor that racism affects his business. I don't feel discriminated against until a white girl or woman comes to buy from the grocery store. As soon as she sees me, 
she changes her mind about buying and leaves. There's a widespread belief that a black man would harm her. That offends me. What really is evil with the black color? How is it any less or absurd not to be white? It would always remain a mystery, considering the organic electric at work with the mentality and minds of the racist societies. Bakit, who lives in the Nusayrat camp in central Gaza, recalled an incident with one of the security services in Gaza after the split in 2007. The policeman looked inside a taxi and ordered the two dark-skinned men inside to step out. That was us, he said. So, my brother and I stepped out and we headed to the search location. After they made sure that we weren't suspects, we went back to the car. I felt very insulted. The driver asked me why. I told him, it seems we are now in Chicago. Ali Jida, a tour guide and also a former member of the PFLP, has this to say. Any racism by Palestinian Arabs could be blamed on ignorance, further claiming that he had experienced similar prejudice from Israelis. We Afro-Palestinians are duly oppressed as Palestinians, and because of our color, the Israelis call us Kushis. Racism in the Palestinian territories encompasses all forms and manifestations of racism experienced in the Palestinian territories of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, irrespective of the religion, color, creed, or ethnic origin of the perpetrator and victim, or their citizenship, residency, or visitor status. It may refer to Jewish settler attitudes regarding Palestinians as well as Palestinian attitudes to Jews and the settlement enterprise undertaken in their name. Accusations of racism and discrimination have been leveled by Palestinians and Israelis against each other. Racism in the Palestinian territories is also used definitely to refer to prejudice directed at Palestinians of African origin, such as the Afro-Palestinian community. This has never been in a mild order, relentless, promising to never end, creating ceaseless spurts of experiential misfortunes for the collective African community living in Palestine. In conclusion, being black in Palestine is a nightmarish state of reality that calls out loud to our collective humanity all over the globe. It's a state which Palestine as a nation is urged to bury by all means with the day's chaos which, as we hope, should be over in the shortest possible time. Navigating the complexities of dual identities as a person, facing both external and internal challenges, is a journey nobody would desire to walk. As the global exercise on racial justice continues to evolve, understanding the unique intersectionality of being black in Palestine becomes a call for empathy, solidarity, and a recognition of the shared humanity that binds us all. This brings us to the end of this video segment. Do you have a thing or two to share? Go ahead and tell us what you think in the comment section below. We are always delighted to hear your thoughts. Also, kindly remember to be supportive by pressing the like button in your front, share with family and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and subscribe to keep the channel growing. Thank you for watching.